if you don't say good morning loud enough, I keep prompting you until you do because I, I come to find out over the years that whenever you're speaking to any group, there's some people there that have broken hearts and they got things going on, they've got problems. There's all kinds of things going on. And the good morning they say may be the best they can get out. So they are giving their best. So I don't want to prompt them to give me an artificial good morning or anything. But uh, we're here talking about creationism and evolution. And you know, it would be real simple if this were 35, 45 years ago. You could just get up and say, evolution is a theory that makes no sense. And just go on and not even worry about it. Because in the school system and everything, it was being reinforced. You know, there's not all this agenda of um, evolution. And the, Ameri the Academy of Sciences were not behind evolution. And Scientific American and all the medical journals and tech journals and everything, they weren't so sold out to evolution, but now they are. And because that our children and grandchildren and everything are being exposed probably to somewhere in the vicinity of 40 to 100 hours of evolutionary thought process each week, you can see that it's a tremendous thing to try to present creationism. And besides that, some of our young people are fairly uh, skeptical today anyway of the Bible and the old folks' ways and the church and things like that with the... Uh, amount of them that's belling out of the church. When they get old enough to be their so-called boss, they're gone. They go off to college, they don't go to church anymore. They come home, they go to church with the grandparents and the parents just because they sort of want them to, you know. But uh, the children are vastly, vastly leaving and our churches are getting older and older and older. And sometimes you go to church and see, I'm privileged to talk about this now. But my wife and I looked around at the church we visited one time and she says, well, there's not a lot here. I said, no, says, everybody here is a widow or soon to be widow, you know. And in other words, it was just the elderly. And uh, so if we are not careful, and if we don't really start teaching our children and grandchildren about this divine sovereign creator, and if we don't start really living the life in front of them that we know we believe in a divine sovereign creator, then they're, they're going to listen to the others when they present their hundreds and hundreds of hours of so-called evidence. Well, we're here this morning to talk about how, just how old is the earth. Well, if we're going to try to figure out how old the earth is, we should use a scientific method. And a scientific method, as you can see, is you get, you get an ideal. You formulate a hypothesis, then you search all the literature to find all the data that's been done or presented or research this particular subject and then you shake it down and you formulate your hypothesis or theory and you present it to whoever it is that's going to fund this program and uh, they approve for you to do the research so you set up your experiment and you set up your experiment with controls and uh, the controls is so that you can see that you do get something different from the experimental group than the control group and then you gather your data this may take you weeks months it may take years and uh, you gather this data and then you shake this data down and you evaluate it and you come up with a, a uh, final conclusion. And then you present this in written form uh, to those that are going to evaluate it. If it's a dissertation or a thesis or a, a postdoctoral study or a fellowship or something of that nature or just uh, research done for some private corporation, some drug uh, company or something of that nature or some engineering outfit. But anyway, someone has to look at that and they decide that that was good work. But then what you have to do to really figure out if it's really good work or not, and honest work or accurate, then you have to repeat the experiments. And so you should be able to repeat the experiment exactly as the researcher has done. And if he did good research, you should be able to gather the same data and come to the same conclusion. In other words, and then if that's done time after time after time, uh, if this is in the arena of science, then this could become a scientific theory and then over time it will be named a law. And you've heard of some of these laws, the first law of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics. You've heard of the gas laws, Boyle's law, Henry's laws, Charles' law, law of gases diffusion. You've heard of the laws of motion, first, second, and those numbered numbers of Newton's laws of motion, the law of gravity. And so these are things that are absolutes. They're proven, they're absolutes. If you do an experiment, if you hold a pencil in your hand and turn it loose, the law of gravity will take place every time. And 
and uh, every time it'll drop to the floor. But now according to evolution, given enough time, anything can happen at least once. That's a basic tenet of evolution. Given enough time, anything can happen at least once. Therefore, someday, maybe a million years from now, maybe a hundred billion years from now, you know, given enough time, anything can happen at least once. So I should be able to drop a pencil, turn a pencil loose right here, and what should that pencil do? It should go up and lay on the ceiling, according to evolution. He said, that's ridiculous. They wouldn't believe in something like that. Oh, yes, they do. Given enough time, anything can happen at least once. And if it can happen at least once, it can happen as many times as need to be to get from A to B to C, because after all, evolution is a theory of unlimited time. Prove what I mean about this. When I was in grade school, I never even knew about evolution. Got to high school, I heard about evolution, and they were speculating the earth was 100,000 years old to a million years old. Time I got up to the university, uh, that had jumped up to somewhere in the vicinity of several millions of years. Time I got in graduate school, it jumped to billions of years. When I got out of graduate school, it was three and a half to five billion years. After the last Hubble thing, it's now jumped to 12 to 15 billion years as the age of the universe. Because they need more and more time. Because the longer they do research in the arena of evolution, the more they come up against stone walls and they need more and more time. So they have to, evolution is a very clever device. Their evidence is always too old to find too far out to see, or it occurs so slow you can't observe it, or so fast it leaves no evidence. I'm, and I'm serious now, this is, this is absolutely the truth. What I'm telling you is the, these are the, the theories and things. For instance, how do you date a rock? You date a rock, according to evolutionists, you date a rock by the fossils you find in it. They have index fossils. You date a rock by the fossils you find in the rock. So that's the way that you date a rock. How do you date the fossil? By the rocks it's found in. Well, that's crazy. To date a rock by the fossils you find in it and date a fossil by the rocks you find it in is circular thinking. And circular thinking will not work with a scientific uh, principle up here, the way that you do experimentation in science. Why, if I were to present a project to a head of a department somewhere at a major university and he saw that I was using circular thinking why, he'd, he'd just tell me to leave the school. In other words, he wouldn't even consider me to even be a, 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 a basic scientist, much less any type of research scientist or anything of that nature. But it seems like in the area of evolution, circular thinking is okay because they present it in a linear form. And I'll show you what I mean in just a moment. And even in the linear form that they present it, it's still speculation and imagination. It is an arena of speculation and imagination. Well, this is the scientific method right here. And so uh, to become a law, it has to be repeatable, observable, and all that. Now, whether you're dealing with evolution or creationism, either one, you're dealing with getting something from nothing and the living from the non-living. And you're also working in the arena of the complex. We all agree that uh, the things around us are very complex, the plants, the animals, and everything's very complex. The evolutionists have a little different ideal. They feel that it started simple and is getting more and more complex, whereas the creationist, we believe, it started very complex, yet God used simplicity to make all this complexity. And to show you what we mean, everybody nowadays pretty well have heard about DNA. DNA is the sequence of the base groups on strands. Uh, it's our uh, genes. It's in our uh, the chromosomes. It's in each cell of our body. And the DNA is the sequencing. And the, the uh, DNA, no matter where it's found, and DNA is found in everything it's living, doesn't matter if it's plant or animal, DNA is made up of only four different base groups. In other words, you have reoccurring chains of phosphates and sugars and phosphates and sugars and phosphate sugars. Sometimes you have hundreds of thousands of phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar. But coming off of these sugars is a little base group and there's only four different ones. Everything in, on this earth, in this creative system, is made up of those four base groups. Those four base groups determine everything there is to determine about every person in this room. The color of the eyes, the color of the hair, how many hairs you have on your head, how many hairs you have on the first knuckle of the 
first finger on the left hand. These, these hairs right there are numbered by your DNA. You have a specific number in accordance with your DNA. Every freckle, everything on your body is determined by the DNA, the color of your eyes, the, the shape of your eyes, the ears, the earlobes, everything, your fingernails. It doesn't matter what there is about your body. Everything is predetermined by the DNA that you were given by your father and your mother. Your father gave you a half set of DNA, your mother gave you a half set of DNA, and the combination of that two half sets made a whole set, made you, and you are the DNA that you were given. You are not a victim of your surroundings and your culture and raised in a ghetto. You're not a victim of, uh, of alcohol or drugs or rape or incest. You're not all that. That's not what makes you up. You are what the DNA is that you were given. Now these other things are unfortunate, can modify your life. But we should not use any of these as excuses to think that we were dealt uh, from the bottom of the deck or something. God ordered us to have a specific sequence of DNAs because in Psalms 139, he says that he, he knew us while we were in the womb. He formed us. He knew us before we were even conceived. He knew exactly how he's going to make us. God never does anything wrong. God is holy, righteous. There's all kinds of consequences of sin running around the, in the, uh, the creation. And uh, those consequences we have to live with. One of the consequences is dying a physical death. One of the consequences is getting old and uh, the organs wearing out and things of that nature. And we do what we call physically aging and dying. Other things, we're stuck with different languages because of the sin at the Tower of Babel. Uh, we are stuck with all kinds of consequences of our forefathers' sin. Sin consequences do travel down through the generations. And, but we're never held accountable for our father's sin, only accountable for our own sin, see. And so we have to have a, a thought process that gets beyond the consequences of sin. We spend too much time in the dying process and the aging process. We just worry about it too much. We spend too much time. We should be involved in, what can we do for the Lord now that I'm 66 years old? Even though I have some failing health, what can I still do for the Lord? Who can I pray for? How much, who can I uh, uh, do a project for, something of that nature? In other words, uh, I cannot find retirement in the Bible anywhere. I really can't. Besides that, you have to work too hard when you retire. Everybody should have at least one or two jobs so you can get some rest. And uh, I've discovered that myself. And, but this, this thing of creation and evolutionism, you know, it's to call them ism their religions, their philosophies, their thought processes. Evolution absolutely is not scientific. And the way we're going to do it today, we're going to show you some things about aging of the earth. How old is the earth? You know, because that seems to be a great contention here. We had a big bang in the past, you know. First place, big bang's impossible to occur because it has to violate many, many of the laws. Now, first place, where did you get this hydrogen from that's imploding? In other words, you have to have hydrogen atoms to have a big bang. Where did those hydrogen atoms come from? Have they always existed? Where did, if they have not, where did they come from? Can you get something from nothing? Did There was nothing and suddenly there was something. There was billions of, of atoms of helium. Not helium, but hydrogen. And then the next place... Two atoms cannot approach each other unless there's an external energy to move them. Because they'll be equally distributed. You know, if, if this were a, a chamber here, a sealed chamber, and it was a vacuum, and I were to bring in ten atoms of oxygen, and I, I turned them loose in this room, they would go to, to the specific spots in this room to be equal distances apart. Those ten would spread out in a way to fill this room. If I gave you 10 balloons and I said to distribute them equally in the room, I don't want any two balloons any closer to each other than any other two balloons. All balloons have to be equally distance apart. That's what it would have been like before the Big Bang started. It would have had to have been. Now, those balloons will just hang here unless I come up and move one. There has to be an energy source to move it. So there had to be an energy source to move some of this hydrogen closer 
So now we can start considering a thing called gravity because since we got these two closer than these two, these two will attract and start pulling toward one another. And then once they get closer, they'll form a, a mass in a smaller space. Therefore, they'll attract others to start pulling in. And But you see, first we had to get the hydrogen atoms from somewhere, something from nothing. Then we had to get energy from non-existent energy. There was no energy available. Where did this energy come from for this Big Bang Theory? So somewhere magically they get the hydrogen, somewhere magically they get the energy, and somewhere magically it starts imploding and coming in on itself in violation of the law, gas laws. Now, how many of you all have ever uh, taken in compressed air? You can put your hand on an automobile tire and start filling it up. And what will it do? You'll feel it getting warmer. Because as you, as you start uh, putting that air in there and you're compressing it and you're getting it more dense, there's more activity between those atoms or molecules and you have heat. So therefore, what happens um, if you have a balloon that's this big and the room gets real hot, what will happen to that balloon? Get larger. So, you know, what happens when you, your tires are about uh, 28 pounds per square inch this morning, about 50 degrees out there, and you hit the interstate to go to Lexington, and you're doing about 65 to 70 going up the interstate, you stop up about Richmond and gauge your tires. They've been to 30 pounds per square inch. Well, we know we didn't gain any. We didn't put any additional air in the tires. What's happened, the tires have heated up, and it has expanded... There's more space between the molecules, and therefore it heats up. In other words, when you heat up, you get more space between the molecules, and your pressure goes up because it's a semi-rigid device. Well, when I have this atmosphere out here, and these molecules are coming in, and they're getting more dense and more dense, and they have more activity, they heat up. Now, what happens to air when it heats up? It expands, so the more it tries to get together, the more it would try to go apart. So how could you ever implode if it's resisting itself coming together? The more it tries to come together, the more it spreads apart. The more it tries to come together, the more it spreads apart. In other words, you can't have a hydrogen cloud implosion. It's absolutely impossible. You can't get something from nothing. You can't invent energy. That's a violation of the... Uh, First and second laws of thermodynamics, the first law of thermodynamics says you have mass and you have energy. That's all you have, a certain amount. You can convert mass to energy and energy to mass, but you cannot create nor can you destroy mass or energy. So you see, to invent this energy to move these hydrogen atoms closer together is to violate the laws of thermodynamics. To have it to come together and compress and stay together until it can blow itself apart is a violation of the gas laws. To get something from nothing is a violation of the first law of thermodynamics. You say, well, how in the world can they formulate all these theories and everything? And, 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 and these laws are out there. They just ignore them. They say the laws don't count when it comes to evolution. It's outside the laws. They claim that things are getting more complex. They started simple, and it's now getting complex. Well, that's a violation of the second law of thermodynamics, which says that for every natural occurring reaction, like striking a match, that's a chemical reaction, there will be energy lost in that that's never usable again. And the energy is lost in the form of heat. That's never usable again. Therefore, we are going downhill. In other words, this earth is limited in the amount of time that it can exist. Because if we have an end point, what did we have to have? A beginning. You can't have an ending point without a beginning point. We only have so much mass and energy. As we convert mass to energy and energy to mass, a certain amount of energy is lost in the form of heat that is never usable again. It's lost to the system. Why do you think we're having global warming? You think it's because of carbon dioxide? You think it's because of greenhouse effect? You think it's because of smokestacks? They may contribute a little bit. But the reason we have global warming is because of the second law of thermodynamics, which God established when Adam and Eve fell and he put them out of the garden and death came. And he established death. And uh, so what happens when he established death was everything has an ending and now we have uh, the result of the buildup of this excess heat 
and we're going to keep on getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And what does it say in Peter how God's going to destroy the world the next time? By fire. Sure does. And you know, it's perfectly normal and natural to have global warming. Now you can't go to the ecology class at UK and say, oh, but global warming is just a natural event. You know, they'll laugh you out of the class and all that. Uh, that's all right. If they want to be ignorant about it, that's okay. We're spending these hundreds of millions of dollars on all this global warming thing, you know, and all that. I'm going to give you another one. The ozone layer, is supposed to, we're supposed to be destroying it with polluting the atmosphere, right? Now, where, where do we manufacture the most pollutants on Earth? Would you think it's industrialized nations? You know, like the United States, you know, the Northeast, South, United States, where we have industrial factories, Germany, France, you know, the industrialized nations, China, building up big air polluting industries in China. Well, you would think that the ozone layer would be depleted up over the United States and Europe and over China, wouldn't you? Where are the holes in the ozone layers? North and South Pole. How much industry is at the North and South Pole? How many smokestacks? See? There's a lot of these. How about this thing about where a few years ago, remember all the service stations used to be, you'd go in, you'd just have any service station anywhere to put uh, uh, the air conditioner uh, product, uh, what do we call it, uh, Freon in your car. All of a sudden, Freon become a bad guy. Nobody could put it in. They were finding anybody that would crack open an air compressor and let a little Freon out in the atmosphere. You know why? Because they said the Freon was destroying the ozone. Well, now, how many people are cracking their air conditioning compressors over the North and South Poles? I don't think there's much need for air conditioning the North and South Pole anyway. A lot of things we're told are for political international reasons. I don't know who's doing what, why, but I know about the air conditioning one is all of a sudden they took an industry that everybody was working at all of the service repair places and service stations and automobile dealerships and they suddenly put a requirement on it and they narrowed the field down to a very small group that had specialized equipment and license to do it and they created a monopoly is what they did and somebody made a lot of money. Somebody somewhere made a lot of money. I found out a lot of these environmental things, somebody's making a lot of money in the background. Now, I'm an environmentalist, I'm a conservationist, always have been, always will be. But if it comes between a choice for man and an animal, I will always go with man. Always. I'm not going to put man's life at risk for a spotted owl or a loggerhead sea turtle. And I find it a little, little two-faced anyway of our government to protect the eggs of a loggerhead turtle and to protect an eagle's nest with a five-year sentence in prison and a $25,000 fine if you, if you even come around an eagle building a nest and disturb it. You're in big trouble if the federal game wardens catch you. But yeah, we board all the babies who want to. See, they recognize that there's a turtle in a turtle egg. They recognize that there's an eagle in a nest being built for an eagle. But they don't recognize there's human life in the mother's womb. Well, that's another issue, isn't it? I just want to show you some of the two-facedness of this whole issue. And uh, I'm not a radical. You know, I don't own machine guns at home and have camouflage clothes, you know, and sneak out in black at night and all that. I don't do that. But anyway, uh, I just... Uh, I'm just an observer. I, you know, I just, I pile all this information in and I sort it out. And, and then when I sort it out and think through it and I say, there's something wrong here. Violations of this, violations of that and all that. How old is the earth? We're not sure. I can't tell you the earth is 4,004 years old B.C. like uh, Bishop Usher did. He went through the Bible and took all the genealogies. And he said, God created man at 4004 B.C. I can't do that. I know that when Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden, that was about four to 5,000 years B.C. So it's been about uh, six to 7,000 years since Adam and Eve were put out of the garden. We are a very young earth. How long they were in the garden after they were created, I don't know. But I, I, my speculation is they were not there more than a few hundred years. 
Uh, you say, well, they couldn't have been there very long. They didn't have any children yet. Well, see, that's taken 20 first century thought process and forced it back into the Garden of Eden because we think, hey, you get married, you should have a baby within a year, you know. Especially them back there, they had no birth control, did they? And he, God told them to be fruitful, multiply anyway, have lots of children. Well, they couldn't have been there very long because they didn't have any children before they fell, right? Well, see, that's the wrong thought process. We're trying to apply our thought process of today back on top of Adam and Eve who lived way back in a different covenant. And they were uh, not aging. I don't know how many times the earth would have gone around the sun, which we call one year, before they'd had a child. But I know even after they fail, that they, couples were not having their first child sometimes until they were 75, 80, or 90 years of age. So that was after they fail. How long would they have gone before having a child? Time was of no essence before the fall. Because before the fall, there was no such thing as time, except just measurements of days. There's no aging process, no dying process. Adam and Eve were not a day older on the eighth, ninth, or tenth day than they were the day they were made on the sixth day of creation. The sixth day, they were Adam and Eve. The seventh day, they were Adam and Eve. The ninth day, they were Adam and Eve. Fourteen days later, Adam and Eve. A year later, Adam and Eve. They were not any older. They didn't look any older. They had no aging process. Most likely they didn't have navels. They were not born. See? And so there was a big theological problem over that. Some artists drew Adam and Eve in the garden and put navels on them. And boy, the head of the church, I think the Catholic church went crazy. One of the popes did. And he demanded those navels be removed. <laughs> you know, because said, they couldn't have had navels. Well, he's probably pretty, pretty straight on there then the Pope was when he said they didn't have navels. See, you can't take a process of post-fall, post-flood, post-Tower Babel, post, post-Abrahamic covenant, post-Sinaitic covenant, and apply it back. You know, we can't take our thought press and apply it back before those particular covenants. Different cultures, different times, different covenants. Different covenant between God and man. Salvation always being the same, though. Don't ever forget that. Salvation is by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what is the evidence? I want to show you some evidence. Points to the earth being somewhere not less than 7,000 years old, no older than about 35,000. And I have the slightest idea where it falls. My speculation is the earth somewhere between... Seven and 10,000. I don't buy even the upper number of 35. And uh, so, but it's impossible, absolutely impossible for the earth to be a million years old. Millions or billions are out. Absolutely impossible. Yet that's thrown around today as if it's absolute scientific fact. In fact, most, a lot of us Christians we speak evolutionary language without realizing it. Without even realizing it. We speak evolutionary language. So you watch out for it and see if you can catch yourself being an evolutionist in disguise. I bet you will. And uh, we'll see. And that doesn't mean that you believe in evolution. It simply means you're using evolutionary language. Now this is creationism. Now an ism is a religion. It's a philosophy. It takes faith to believe in creation. Do you know that? It takes faith to believe in evolution because you can't do a scientific experiment to prove it. Science is not outside of religion. Science is not the enemy of Christianity. Science strictly is, is observing and trying to explain God's creation. That's all it is. But the evolutionists have captured it, put their religion within science, made it like it's science, and they've cast all religion uh, ideals outside of it, creationism or anything of that nature, God or anything, an external power, a planner, a master designer, a master pattern, anything like that. In spite of all the new evidence of DNA and the master pattern and everything, they just cannot accept it. Do you know after DNA was discovered, the, the sequencing of the base groups discovered by Watson and Crick, and uh, they got a Nobel Prize for that discovery, and ever since then, uh, they've not done any research in the arena of the irreductibility of the cell. What I mean by that is a cell cannot evolve. It is impossible for a living cell to evolve. You can't have a proto-cell 
and then all of a sudden have a living cell. You can't evolve a cell because a cell has a certain minimum parts. It must have the function at all. It must have DNA, it must have RNA, it must have ribosomes, it must have cellular constituents, it must have a cell membrane. There are things it must have to exist as a living cell. You take any one of those five or six things out and it cannot be a cell. So how can you evolve five or six complex things at the same time in the same place to come together at exactly the same moment to form a living cell? Absolutely impossible. It just, the, the chances are astronomical. But then they say, oh yeah, but given enough time, anything can happen at least once. That's their cop-out. Well, they don't have unlimited time. See, that's the, that's the thing about it. They, whenever they need a few hundred million years, they just add it on. Well, you can't do that. How can you just come along arbitrarily like Hubble telescope and before that they saw what they thought was the edge of the universe out at about three and a half to five billion years. They got this more powerful telescope and now they saw the edge of the universe out 12 to 15 billion. So they said, oh, we were wrong. The, uh, yeah, the, the universe is not expanded to three and a half to five billion years light years from the center. It's expanded 12 to 15 billion light years. You know how much 12 to 15 billion light years is? You take a 12 and you add three zeros and three zeros and three zeros. Nine zeros. That's 12 billion. Now that's 12 billion years of light moving at 86,000 miles per second. Small lands. Astronomical. Well, in the first place, here's a little thought process you might think about. Have you ever tried to put something into nothing? Just, now that's a dumb question. Have you ever tried to put something into nothing? Well, nothing doesn't exist. You can't put something into nothing. Well, how is our universe expanding? How's it expand? What's it expanding into? If something's already there, that's part of the universe, right? So how can it be expanding into nothing? If nothing doesn't exist, you can't put something in it. Then the scripture says, man cannot measure God's creation. We're wasting our money on Hubble and these space adventures trying to find the edge of the universe. We're not going to be able to do it. Because the scripture says man cannot measure God's creation. Creation is unlimited. We can't even comprehend that. We have finite minds. We are not infinite. We cannot explain the infinite ways of God. That's where we make tremendous mistakes trying to speak for God and trying to make rules for God or trying to box him in. We know very little about God. But we know all we need to know. He's our creator and he created us to have relationship and fellowship with him and he loves us and even though he made us in his, in his image and we chose to fall, he has made redemption possible for us. And this life is only about one thing, making one choice. All of life, even though we're married, we have children, grandchildren, we have homes, jobs, we have all this. We've built all that up. But the one thing that we're here for is to make the decision where we will spend our eternalness. This is a temporary abode for us. We're eternal right now. Everybody in here is an eternal being. You will never cease to exist. I will never cease to exist. We're all eternal. But our life here is simply to make the decision where will we spend eternity when we step outside of this fallen body and we obtain our glorified body. And will we spend this eternity in our glorified body in the presence of God or will we spend it in this special abode that God has set apart for Satan and the beast and the prophet and fallen angels? God did not make the lake of fire or outer darkness for unbelievers. God never intended there be a single unbeliever. God desires that everybody be a believer. But when they unbelievers, that holding place they're in right now called hell, when time ceases to be just before God destroys the heaven and the earth in Jerusalem, 
He's going to have a white throne of judgment and he's going to bring all unbelievers of all ages before him and judge them on the basis of their works because they have no redemption or salvation. So they'll get judged on the basis of works and all works are said to be as filthy rags. So God says, I don't know you. Name's not in the book. Depart from me. They only have one place they can go. They only have one place they can go. That's the place prepared for Satan. God does not send anyone to the lake of fire except for Satan, the beast, the prophet, and the fallen angels. Man chooses to go to the lake of fire. It is our choice. Our choice. See? Well, that's what it's all about. That's creationism. And, uh, you know, we've reviewed these before, just to bring them. Genesis 1-1 tells us when, what, who, where. John 1-1, Jesus Christ, same as God, present there. Psalms 139, that God that has all those four great attributes of all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present, and totally, absolutely righteous and holy. And then Colossians 1-16 and 17, which says Jesus Christ is the power that holds everything together. And that was about those pluses you saw there, Ray. That's the protons of every atom have a positive charge on them. And they're all clustered together at the center of every atom. Every atom in the universe has a center in it. And it has plus charges in it except for hydrogen. Hydrogen only has one plus charge positive proton and one negative charge electron. It's the simplest of all elements. All the other elements have multiple plus charges and minus charges and all these plus charged protons, these particles, they're real. They actually exist. They're particles. They're clustered together in a little ball together at the center of the atom. Positive charges all holding together. And like we said before, you've played with magnets. Plus charges don't hold together. So there has to be a power holding that together. Now in Star Trek and Star Wars, it's called the force. You know? or something that comes from Nirvana or somewhere, through Spock or somebody. But in the Bible, it, it's Jesus Christ, Colossians 1, 16 and 17. He's the power that holds everything. Everything consists because of him. Now, how easy it will be for God to destroy the heavens and the earth and Jerusalem? He just simply say, heavens and earth and Jerusalem, you know, the universe, I decree or whatever what I, God does or says or thinks, I don't know how he does it, He's just going to turn that power loose that holds those atoms together and everything will go. And all that will return to nothing. It will be totally, totally nothing again. We will be there in the eternal area where God has always been and is. And God's going to create a new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem and we're going to abide in the new heavens and earth in Jerusalem and have access to heaven and be with God. Eternity. I can't even comprehend what that means. I can stay off, speak all day about it. But Jesus force telling you what it's going to be like? Can't tell you. Now we get a little hint when you go back and look at Adam and Eve in the garden before they fail. You can get a little hint. Uh, but uh, we get that again in the millennium to show what it could have been like had we not sinned and fallen. But eternalness and eternity, I cannot give you any idea what that'll be about. You know why? Because my mind can't comprehend it. You know why I can't comprehend it? It's a fallen, finite mind. I can't comprehend it. All I know is God's promised it. Through his scripture, he's always kept his word. Okay, those are some verses on it. And, of course, you know in the creation week, we have those days delineated out, six days. Some people get so intimidated by evolution, they come up with theistic evolution, uh, where God used great ages and eons of time for each day. And, they, and also, this quote, a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day, that doesn't mean anything. All it means is to God, a day and a thousand years are immaterial. You and I are the ones that live in time. We're the ones that live in time. And time means nothing to God. And so we have this, uh, this time frame here of six days, see. Well, then the rest of the story is we're made in God's image. And God saw it was very good when he created mankind. In other words, that was the top of his creation. How about evolution? See, we have the Bible for creationism. 
Evolution, we've already talked about this, given enough time, anything can happen at least once. And uniformitarianism is that things happen at the same rate all the time. Uh, like, how long did it take the Colorado River to cut the Grand Canyon? That used to be the theory. The Colorado River's out there and over this, given enough time, anything can happen. Well, given enough time, hundreds of millions of years, that Colorado River cut a canyon five miles wide and a mile deep. Well, there's not any reputable geologist or scientist today that believes that. But you know, that's still being taught. That's still the concept. The Grand Canyon was made probably in no longer than a few days or a week. And we'll talk about that later as we study and we get to talking about Mount St. Helens and things of that nature. Uniformitarianism says that if you find a stalactite in a cave, the stalactite is being made at, say, uh, I'm just going to use some fake figures, an inch every thousand years. And if I found a four-inch stalactite, then I could say if it grows an inch every thousand years and it's four inches long, then it took 4,000 years to grow that stalactite, right? Well, you know, Mammoth Cave, we got stalactites and stalagmites out there that says that the Mammoth Cave's been out there 300, 400, 500 million years. They're so big. And then you go over to Clear Creek and go underneath one of the steel bridges we have there, and we have four to six inch stalactites hanging off the bottom of that bridge. So that says that bridge is four to 6,000 years old. See? They say, oh, well, that's an anomaly. Well, how can you have an anomaly if you have a theory of uniformitarianism? Well, index fossils. Yeah, index fossils are stacked up artificially in an artificial geological column, and fossils used to date layers of rocks, and layers of rock are used to date fossils, circular thinking and reasoning. Geological column and fossils go together. Big Bang, we've already talked about Big Bang. These are basic tenets of evolution right here. Evolution is supposed to occur very slowly. It's supposed to left a lot of evidence, but when they didn't find the evidence, then they have it to occur very quickly. Well, slowly, see, you had nothing here. You got something from nothing. And this was chaos and Big Bang. Then you had no life and you suddenly got life, so you had one cell life forms and none life. And you see none life just continues right up the chart. We have the none living with us today. It's called rocks, you know, things that are not living. Then this one cell simpler, you know, if it evolved into uh, one cell with a nuclear membrane, you'd have thought that all one cells without a nuclear membrane, you know, a membrane to bind up the DNA inside of it, if an evolutionary process says that this is not successful and it evolved so it could be successful and survive, what would you expect to happen to all the ancestors? To die out. But yet we're supposed to have gone through this stage of one cell without a nuclear membrane, one cell with a nuclear membrane, then multicellulars with nuclear membranes, and then multicellulars that are plants, multicellulars that are fungi, multicellulars that are animals. And animals went on to evolve into many, many different uh, species. And plants went on to evolve to 250,000 different species. And we have all this that you see today that's supposed to have come from this very first one living cell. Well, <laughs> if the reason we evolved is to be successful because of pressures of the environment and things, survival of the fittest, then up here today, we should not have any one cells without a nuclear membrane or one cells with a nuclear membrane. We shouldn't have any of those. Yet bacteria are one cells without a nuclear membrane, and there's literally hundreds of millions of them living right here on my arm right now. You say, why didn't you take a bath? Well, I did. But they still come back. You know, they, oh, this is, you're not going to like this. That a bacteria sitting up there on your skin, they eat your dead skin all the time. And it sloughs off in your house, and that's the reason why no matter how good a housekeeper you are, you have dust in your house. That's your skin. And, uh, oh, now, boy, you're going to clean the house now. And uh, if you don't take a bath very often, the digestion of that skin by those bacteria, they leave a residue, and that residue is what causes the smell, you know, that you get from not taking a bath at least once a month or something like that. And that's amazing what you discover in science, isn't it? Well, but today we have the non living. We have the one cell with a nuclear membrane, one cell without a nuclear membrane. We have multicellulars. We have plants. We have animals. Why do we have such diversity? I mean, can it make up its mind which one is to survive? 
And uh, the other thing is survival of the fittest is a basic tenet of evolution. Then why are we trying to protect certain species of animals? Why are we trying to do it? Why are we setting aside vast land areas for a certain migratory bird? Trying to keep it from vanishing from the environment. The pressures of the environment in evolution are simply natural selection, survival of the fittest. So here are this environmentalist evolutionary people out here and they believe this theory but yet they set aside land everywhere for special plants and animals trying to keep them alive and so it looks to me like they're working against their own theory. And if you really believe in evolution there shouldn't be anything at all wrong with killing the weak in society. There shouldn't be anything wrong with that, just survival of the fittest. Because if there's no creator, there's no morality, there's no absolute, there's no law. We're a law unto ourselves. Well, that's the chart there. And um, so then, this always, I always have fun with this one here. The uh, fossils and the geological column. Uh, no, no life forms down here. You know, that's about a mile deep. Precambrian layer geologically. And then you have some primitive life forms up here in the Cambrian layer, about 17 different life forms around here in the Precambrian Cambrian layer. And then you have all these different names for these rock layers. And look here, you come through invertebrate marines, that means they don't have a backbone. Vertebrate marines, that means they have a backbone. Amphibians, that means they live in the water, out of the water. Reptiles mean they live only out of the water. Birds mean they can fly, aves. Mammals means they're specifically uh, now uh, uh, evolving toward us. And then we get man. And look at the time period. Five billion, one billion, half, half a billion, 70 million years ago, the reptiles, dinosaurs, two to three million for mammals, 100,000 to one million for ape-like men and men like apes. Now, you can see that this is the evolutionary theory right here. The evolutionary theory is you didn't have life, you had simple life forms, invertebrate marines. We started out in the ocean. We crawled out of the ocean on land. We got trapped outside of land. We started bobbing in toward mammals, toward man. Some of us learned to fly. And they become birds. So you accommodate all the insects and everything in here. You put all the plants in here. Coal was supposed to have been made right here 70 million years ago during the age of the dinosaurs, a great fern forest and everything. And uh, coal is the residue of uh, plants. Oil is said to be the residue of animals. And uh, so how in the world do we find iron pots in coal seams? How do we find gold chains inside coal lumps? How do you find skeletons of men in coal seams? All this has been found. You talk to coal miners and you'll, you'll find there's a lot of things found in coal. They find them very interested and talk about them, just cast them aside or take them home, put them in the yard as a souvenir. Down at Clear Creek on the back of the new academic building, I have four pieces of big coal fossils that's taken out of coal seams in Bell County. And I have a fossil of a very large uh, branch of a tree, it might even been the trunk of the tree, it came out of Yuma Proving Grounds in Arizona that I went out and got some fossilized trees out of there. I was given permission to do it, as long as I didn't pick up any of the duds and try to take them out, you know. And, uh, but anyway, you see that the theory is this way, and all this is buried. All of it's stacked up in very specific layers called the geological column. First place, this geological column does not exist anywhere on the surface of the earth. It only exists in books. Nowhere. You'll find this layer up here and this layer down there. There's all scattered around. Nowhere on earth do you find a geological column like this. Now you'd have thought if the earth went through millions of years of evolution simultaneously over the earth, the layers would be stacked up that way. But it's not. They're not stacked up in accordance with invertebrate marines, vertebrate marine amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, man. Nowhere, not on earth. Only in books. And it looks beautiful in books. Boy, they got these nice charts. You see them in the Time Life books, you see them in National Geographic, you see them in all the science and biology books, geology books, paleontology, archaeology, any kind of these ologies you go to has been permeated now by the evolutionary thought process. Well, here's my idea right here very quickly, something I spotted and I thought, this doesn't make sense. If this was the size of the earth back then, 
Where did all this new material come from to bury these? And then where did all the new material come from to bury these? You see what I'm saying? Where's all this new rock and soil and debris coming from? They say, well, it's coming from inside the earth through volcanic action. That's what they say. Well, that means the earth must be a great big old empty ball, but now we've emptied ourselves from the inside out. Well, the other thing is, if the earth was this much smaller back then, our orbit would not have been the same around the sun and it would not have sustained life or especially an evolutionary process. You know, the size of the earth is very, very specific to our orbit around the sun. And the size of our earth is very specific for the orbit of the moon around the earth. All this is very, very specific. The 23 and a half degree angle, our earth sits like this. The oblong orbit, the elliptical orbit, everything that we have. This column doesn't exist. These fossils don't exist in this order. These are all lined up just in a book arbitrarily. Well, fossils, what are they? Remains of organisms, footprints, other evidence of once living organisms preserved in rock. Index fossils, a fossil used to date the rock which is found or not found. That's what amazes me. An index fossil can date a rock that it's not found in. And so we have already talked about how that Index fossils are used to date the rock, and the rock is used to date the fossil. And as you can see, that's just not good science at all. Well, let's look at some of these evidence of old age for Earth. You've heard of some of these. Neanderthal man, been determined to be Homo sapiens like you and me. Cro-Magnum, been determined to be Homo sapiens like you and me. Piltdown Man was a hoax perpetuated for about 40 years on society. Man won Nobel Prize. Man was knighted by the King of England. Uh, he's, he was tremendously wealthy from this. And after his died, his widow decided to give this jawbone of this Piltdown Man. They built a whole man now on a jawbone. And when she was going to give it to the, uh, the Royal Institute in England, that's equivalent to our Smithsonian, and they were horrified when they got it and they found metal file marks on the teeth and they found out the jawbone was an ape bone, a, a, like ape bone that had, the teeth had been filed down to look human. And he, this had been a perpetuated hoax. And I can say this thing is in the textbooks. This thing is still taught in some textbooks. Java man's been determined to be a homo sapiens uh, with rickets. They found the thigh bone. Thigh bone, that's all. And they built a whole Java man, missing link from that. Now it's been determined to be a man with rickets. We have much better scientific ways to investigate things now. Peking man's been determined to be monkey skulls. Nebraska man's been determined to be a pig. They found one tooth in Nebraska, a fossilized tooth, and they built a whole man. They drew the, what the whole man looked like from that one tooth. Have you ever wondered how they can do that from one little piece of bone? They can draw the whole animal or man. They even tell you what color eyes he had almost. Well, they found out to their surprise, they found a pig skull, a petrified pig skull, and the tooth fit perfectly and matched the teeth in the pig skull, and it's a pig's tooth. And all these Africanicus, they're finding in Africa, they're just fossilized apes and gibbons and monkeys. There is not a single ape-like, man-like, or anything. And right there will be a good place to start next week. And it'll take me a, a time or two to really get caught up, and I'll start right here. And you all remind me, this is where I want to be now next week. Miller and Urey's experiment on creating life in the laboratory, 1953. We'll start right there.